so this is a talk. This is a talk um, which means basically I get to explore some issues that are interesting to uh, to me. Um, and what I'd really, really like is if um, sorry, I'm shutting everything down. Um, what, I'd, what I'd like to do is run through it as quick as possible, really, and then pick up any comments or thoughts or queries or um, contradictions that you might have, because I think that will really help refine what I'm sure you'll see is rather a work in progress. But what I'm also going to do is try and share this work in progress in the context of um, three ex exemplar learning, mobile learning ex experiences, two from Singapore and one old one, which I'm sure people will be familiar with from Bristol. And really what I'm doing is offering a framework that we can use to compare these different things, um, which helps us pay attention to the design of mobile learning. Uh, activities. So, by the need for this kind of thing came um, made itself apparent to me um, after a number of mobile pr projects that I tried to put together or tried to work on with other people. Um, it just seemed it felt as though everything got done at the same time. That we would try and design the learning experience, we try and link it with the curriculum, we try and understand how it works from a pedagogic point of view. At the same time as we were trying to test the functionality. Um, learn how to use whatever interface we were using, um, as well as requisitioning the kit, charging everything, loaning it all out, writing permission letters, busing all the students out to wherever it was, and so on. And I'm sure that's quite a familiar set of experiences. Um, the upshot of all this was that it was very hard to tell why something seemed to work. We do something that seemed to be quite positive, everyone had very good feelings about it, but um, we weren't really sure why it seemed to be such a positive experience? Was it just the fact that it's fun to do? Was it the fact that um, we designed something that was very robust? Was it just the fact that when you use new pieces of equipment that people haven't seen before, um, that's quite exciting itself? Um, was it the fact that we're outside and not in the classroom, which again is, is quite a novelty? Um, it was very difficult for us to tease these things apart. And as a mobile learning researcher, I'm interested in understanding um, you know, what's, what's fundamentally good and positive about a particular experience and what's more to do with implementation. So for, for me, I, I was interested in seeing how I could talk about the um, the kind of underlying framework of what we were doing, the underlying skeleton, sorry, the underlying skeleton rather of what we were doing um, before we get to talking about any kind of technology or implementation. So what I mean by that um, is really just the underlying structure and flow of an activity. Um, I often call it boxes and arrows. Um, you know trying to represent things as a flow chart or UML diagram or something, but looking at it in the abstract, looking at the conditionality, saying if people do this, then this will happen. Um, on the other hand, if they do that, then we'll do this. Um, really thinking not so much about the implementation of a project or the um, project management, which I think Judy Brown talked a lot about, which uh, in her really interesting slides, I was having a look on the wiki earlier, and there's <laughs> an awful lot there I'm kind of wary of adding to it. Um, Really what I was interested in is looking at the design of the activity so that we could link it, draw, draw lines across from it to the pedagogical approach that we were trying to support. So rather than doing something with mobile learning because the mobile technology lets us do it or because a certain interface forces us down a certain route, I was interested in seeing how we could talk about an activity that lets us examine it on its own merits. Hopefully. That will become what I'm talking about there, if it's not clear. It already will become clear over the next um, few, few minutes as, as we look at three mobile learning experiences. But first, first of all, I just want to share some, term, some terminology, uh, or rather my understanding of some terminology that I'm sure will be familiar to everyone in this room. Um, learning trails. Now, this is a phrase that in the UK I haven't really come across, but I'm currently based in Singapore. And in Singapore, mobile learning talk is pretty much all uh, based around this idea of learning trails, it seems to me. Um, the idea of a learning trail predates mobile stuff, as far as I can tell, and it's basically the time-honoured um, uh, activity of taking a busload of kids, putting them at the start of the trail somewhere, having them walk around the course or the zoo or the museum or whatever it is, um, ticking off things as they go or doing activities at certain stations, uh, certain activity points, um, and, and, and then when you get to the end of the trail, everyone's done. So there's been quite a move over the last probably five or six years in Singapore to kind of transfer those kind of activities to a mobile platform. 
um, fundamentally the reason it's always given to me by people from the Infocom Development Agency or the Ministry of Education or the individual schools that do this is that a worksheet is one way that the people write stuff down on it and that's the end. Whereas with mobile equipment you can have two-way communication and of course this is an argument for mobile learning, everyone knows very well. Um, whether they act, whether that's used to its full extent either in the UK or here um, or anywhere is, is always um, rather moot, I think. But that's really the principle behind a lot of the things that have been done here. And there are some really interesting examples. Um, there's, there's one in Chinatown where you can be a, you, you take on the role of a San Sui woman. Um, the San Sui women were immigrants to Singapore, women from China who were renowned for their skill at building. And they had a distinctive red headscarves and their earthy, earthy hum humour. Um, and most of them have died out. There's one still living on my estate. Um, it's another piece of his history. Anyway, so this is a really important part of Singapore's past, and it's something that lots of people don't get to encounter. And the people that also this Chinatown learning trail thought it'd be interesting to give people the chance to try and see it through the eyes of the San Sui woman, or an opera singer, or a ritual puller, but roles that help people to connect with what Chinatown used to be. Um, there's another one, not so much on history, more on kind of geography and biology, at the Wetlands Trail up in Sungai Bulo, which is a kind of marshland mangrove swamp area to, to the north of Singapore. Um, and this revolves around reading QR codes with particular tablet PCs um, at certain points. So these QR codes tr trigger certain kind of content. And this idea that content is what drives mobile learning, I think, is something that's very, very common. I personally find it a bit limiting. I think the idea that learning is revolves around content rather than the activities around the content um, is a bit limiting, and I'm sure everyone here would agree. Um, but I mean, that, that, that's that's what's going on now. So these these are basically ways of replacing the kind of the activity stations with hotspots. Um, in both, I think, with Chinatown and certainly with Bulo and certainly with some of the other ones. Um, the content is triggered by something that's outside the device. So there's nothing intrinsic to the device that triggers it. You have to go and take a picture of the QR code or you have to go and look at the information board or what have you. Um, I'm only really going into detail there to contrast it with um, the kind of location-based experiences that I've been looking at. And obviously those kind of things that I mentioned before are also location-based to some extent. Um, what I'm really looking at is the kind of things that are triggered by GPS rather than an external thing. So you've got the trigger for the content that's on the inside, as it were, uh, and it's the position of the learner that demonstrates, that, sorry, that displays the content that you're that you're after um, interacting with. So what these kind of things have in common, by the location based, so I, sorry, I should say, I sort of put the links up here, I'll put, I'll put them up on the wiki. Um, I've been working mainly with Mediascapes, mscapers.com, was a domain that HP looks after. It's now been shut down. The team um, have moved on to create calvium.com. Um, there's other groups like, uh, well, obviously Layer. They're very famous uh, in terms of augmented reality. And there's sevenscenes.com. That's the figure seven. And then the word scenes.com um, based in Amsterdam who do really interesting work around GPS and a very similar kind of conceptual model to Mediascapes. But what these all have in common, I think, um, or certainly the kind of thing that I'm thinking about is where you have a digital overlay, uh, a kind of a layer of content that corresponds to the physical geographic location. So depending on where you are, you're going to see some different things. Um, different, there are different applications, different examples of these kind of things that um, bind this content more or less tightly to the location. So it can be street by street or door by door or region by region. But the basic principle is it's you moving your body that triggers everything rather than you taking a picture of a QR code or you uh, reading something off an information board. And what that means is that the subjects of these experiences is key. That uh, it's the person, the mind and consciousness who's, who's apprehending all this becomes much more important when we try and talk about the context and um, it's informing any learning that's going on, which we'll dive into later on. Oh, brilliant. Yes, exactly. Um, Ronald. Anyway, so that won't make any sense in the recording. I should say I, I'd be a rubbish radio presenter. Um, yup, is it Yup? Um, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. It's just uh, posted a link to the uh, VARC.org project, um, one of the initial prototypes for the Seven Scenes app application. Um, I'm going to have to annotate this massively on the wiki. I can see this already. Okay, so this is the distinction that I'm looking at. And what I'd like to do is walk through three mobile learning experiences very briefly now. Um, 
to illustrate the kind of the level of detail you can get into if you're linking more or less tightly to the location. So this first one um, I'm going to describe is one that was created by the Singapore School of Science and Technology and the National Institute for Education's Learning Sciences Lab as part of a wider research project that was looking at mobile learning more generally. I've just heard my voice isn't audible. Um, is that true for everybody? Can you wave if uh, if you can hear me? Or comment? Oh, okay. So you're on the phone. Okay. Well, I'll just try and be as clear as I can, uh, and I hope that your phone clears up. Okay. Well, um, while he's running the audio wizard, I'll carry on. So the general impetus behind looking at this mobile learning research project is to support the shift in both the curriculum and the pedagogy towards uh, what they call knowledge age skills, what we probably call um, 21st century skills or network society skills or the kind of thing that's supposed to support participation in the knowledge economy, collaboration, critical thinking, um, adaptive expertise, flexibility, that kind of thing. Um, so you can see that there's a very common um, kind of educational discourse there that's shared between Singapore and Europe. Um, and so, I mean, that's just really just to illustrate they're coming from a very similar kind of context um, to us from a research perspective. The Fort Solosa project was looking at elements of the secondary school history curriculum, although they run an integrated humanities curriculum at the SST. Um, this particular project was looking specifically at um, well, it was, it was motivated rather by a look at history, so some of the activities blend an awful lot with the curriculum, and that's, that's a hallmark of the approach that they take. It's set on Fort Siloso, which is a British World War II camp. Well, actually, it's set up in 1870-something by the British uh, on Sentosa Island, which is a large granite island south of Singapore. Um, it's important historically. It's mainly important historically because of the role it played in World War II, or rather didn't play in World War II. The um, massive gun en encampments were, were pointing out towards the sea, um, which is where an, an attack was anticipated. Um, General Percival, in charge of the British troops there, didn't expect that the Japanese would invade by bicycle over the land bridge to the north. And the rest is history here to surrender, and the Japanese took over for a while, uh, nasty business. So. It's a big part of the Singapore story. It's an important part of the post-colonial story. Um, and part of the military camp has been restored. It's a museum, a heritage centre where you can go as a tourist or as an interested visitor and have a walk around the camp, see how the soldiers would have lived, see what they would have seen and, and so on. And so the elements that make up this location are the, the beach, the sea, the tropical rainforest that surrounds it still, and the, re the restored camp buildings. Um, the activities themselves were located along three particular places, so the kids were walking around the whole location, um, but the activity points were very much set, so you had these three stations that you go and visit in groups of four, um, you've got your MacBook with your group, um, and you're undertaking various tasks using uh, the internet and chat rooms and so on to collaborate, and um, also using the environment that you're in to take readings, gather data, respond to, and so on. Um, and again, I think this would be the educational reasons for thinking this is interesting is something I think is probably fairly common and current, this idea of authenticity, real world context and so on. Personally, I'm not sure how authentic the experiences are just because they're outside, but again, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a live issue and something that's probably outside the scope of this, of this quick talk. Anyway, so this is the kind of thing that they're doing. So they're, they're taking readings and data from the real world and using their mobile, their physically mobile technology and the internet to collaborate, to come up with solutions to the tasks that they've been set. So that's one very quick overview. The second one, um, oh sorry, I should say, um, with regard to the Fort Siloso, that's a project I've heard lots about. I've spoken to teachers that were involved, but it's not one that I've been part of the design of. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about how that works exactly, what the activities were, what the learning outcomes were, and all that kind of thing, do drop me a line. Um, my email appears at the end of this. Uh, or if you're listening to this later, it's richard at richardsanford.net, uh, and I can put you in touch with the teachers and researchers that ran the project. So I highly recommend a chat with them. They're very nice. 